Good morning and welcome to the webinar. My name is Lauren. I am the Educational Services Manager here at Alzheimer's Orange County, and I will be your host today. Thank you for joining us for today's topic on caring for a loved one that did not care for you. Today, we will be discussing the complex and challenging dynamic of providing care for someone who may have not shown you the same level of care in the past. Today, our presenter is Dr. Nina Brown, author of Children of the Aging Self-Absorbed and Coping with Infuriating Mean Critical People. Before we begin, a few reminders. Your mic and video are automatically disabled and will remain so throughout the presentation. However, since we are, will be asking, um, I'm sorry, so any questions that you have, please type them into the chat box and we will address them at the end. A copy of the PowerPoint has been emailed to you yesterday. And if you did not receive it, please email me. My info is in the chat box. And lastly, we ask that you please complete the survey at the end of the webinar, as it helps us to continuously improve our webinars and lets, lets us know what you would like to learn about in the future. So now I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker, Dr. Nina Brown. She's a professor and eminent scholar in the Department of Counseling and Human Services at Old Dominion University. She received her doctorate from the College of William and Mary, is a licensed professional counselor and a nationally certified counselor, and was named a distinguished fellow by the American Group Psychotherapy Association and a fellow in the American Psych Psychological Association. Her specialties are group therapy and the study of narcissism, which from the emphasis for her teaching and scholarship. Dr. Brown helped to initiate the current faculty med mediation program for the university and was named the University Faculty Ombuds by the president in 2021. Nationally, samples of professional service are as a member of APA Council Specialties and APA Commissioner for Accreditation, test panel member of the American Association of State Certifying Licensure Boards, president of the Society of Group Psychology and Group Psychotherapy, and secretary and board member for GPA. Most notable is her development of the petition to APA to have group recognized as a specialty. Dr. Brown writes and publishes books about group psychotherapy and narcissism and has 40 plus books to date, some of which have been translated into other languages. So now, Dr. Brown, I will now hand it over to you. Thank you, Lauren, for that wonderful introduction and welcome to everyone. Uh, I hope you're having a beautiful day where you are. I'm in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and we are having a beautiful day. After suffering through some days where we were hunkering down because they were warning us that a tornado was on the way. But today is beautiful, and I hope that you're having one too. So I call this um, caring for a parent that did not care for you. And even if you are caring for someone who's not a parent, I'm hoping that you'll be able to get some pointers from this because um, you're to be commended. All caretakers are fulfilling a wonderful job and we appreciate you. And I'm sure that you don't get many appreciations and you should because this is a very demanding, emotionally exhausting job and you're doing a you're doing great with it. But it's much harder when it when you're having to care for someone who didn't care for you or who you felt didn't care for you. And so what I'm going to try to go through will be some descriptors, perhaps that you're encountering in that person. Um, what are some indicators that they may be self-absorbed? Um, some responses that you may give or you may experience, um, some of which are effective and some of which are not effective. So I'm going to try to break that down. And if you are running into difficulties, you may want to consider uh, using some of the more effective responses. They are different. So what are some of the descriptors? They're very difficult or can be difficult at times. Many times they're aging. 
unlike the rest of us who are not aging. <laughs> and they're self-absorbed. So how do you know that someone is self-absorbed? Well, I've gone into this in great detail, but here's some of the indicators. Everything is always, almost always about them and their concerns. They have little time and attention to give to other others who have concerns also. They seek attention and admiration. They're exploitive and manipulative. They want to be considered as unique and special. And most of all, there's a noticeable lack of empathy. So what are some of the ineffective responses? And I categorize those into joining, fight, and flight. So when if you're joining, if that's one of your um, responses, you're trying to keep them happy. You do whatever it takes to keep them happy. You soothe them, you placate them. But this can produce guilt and shame because sometimes nothing you do seems to satisfy. Or you may have the fight response, which is to protect yourself. And under this, you may engage in being indifferent to what they're saying or try to be indifferent to what they're saying or defy or challenge them and try to show them that they're not accurate in what they're saying. That doesn't work either. And then that could be flight defenses. And these are the defenses to save the self. The self feels like it's in danger of being destroyed. And so you flee. And some examples of uh, flight defenses are being silent, sulking, withdrawn, avoidance. It is, that usually doesn't work either because they're still there and you're still having to deal with them. So you may try doing this. And there are times when something like withdrawal of silence does work. But overall, you take a look at how effective that is for you. So what are some effective responses? Sympathy and understanding. And not so much empathy is that opens you up to them being able to take over you. So you don't want to do that. But give them sympathy and understanding. And part of that is understanding that they are aging. And they may be ill. They may have suffered many losses. And so you can understand that, yeah, this has affected them. Another effective response is being patient, which is very difficult to do at times. But try to remember that they are as they are, and perhaps they will come around. Perhaps they will try to understand. Um, but in other words, don't be like they are and expect that everybody's going to jump to please you. You could use what I call emotional insulation, and I'm hoping that this is something that you can adopt. And emotional insulation is visualizing something between yourself and them so that when they're at their worst, their words get through so that you know try, can try to understand what they're saying, but the feelings don't get through. So you don't catch their feelings. And yes, you can catch feelings. So when they are depressed or when they're angry or when they're upset, if you're open to it, you can catch it, and then you become angry, upset. And what can happen is that if you can use your insulation, you can still hear what the concern is, but you don't catch those feelings, which allows you to be more effective and to think more about what would be effective. So, and to visualize that, just think of anything. It doesn't make any difference. People have thought of all kinds of things. I had one person who thought of a shade, and they would mind pulling down the shade when they got into something with the other person. Or, you could, or it could be a wall, or it could be a force field, or it could be anything. You just think of what works for you. 
uh, I think a steel gate's closing. Clang. Okay, I hear you, but I'm not letting those feelings get through. Be civil, formal, and courteous. That never fails. You're never in the wrong when you're civil and you're formal and you're courteous. If you have requests, make them firm requests. In other words, don't say, don't be mealy mouth about it. If you want them to sit in that chair, you say, please sit in that chair. And if you need it to be done now, I would appreciate it if you would please sit in that chair now. Remember to say please and thank you. That never hurts. And it does show respect. And you certainly want to show respect. What are some other uh, effective responses? You can do and say things to soothe them. Um, if they're agitated, trying to understand what they're agitated about can help. Just as long as it's not a condescending soothing, like there, there, dear, everything's going to be all right. When you know, and they know, it's not. You could agree with some parts of what they're saying. You don't have to agree with the whole thing. You don't even have to understand the whole thing. But you could agree, well, yeah, that is terrible. Yes, that is awful. That's the non-committal agreement where, yeah, <laughs> you know, and it, they're right sometimes. So, yes, that you be non-committal. In other words, you don't have to buy into what they're saying. Um, and, and if they're complaining about another person, you don't want to join them and complain about that person, too, so that they can say, uh, at some later date, as some might, that you said that they didn't. Um, but if you are kind of noncommittal, yep, that could be, or something like that, the, that at least lets them know you heard what they said. Listen, but don't try to give advice or fix. Uh, Get out of the habit, even if you can see what would make it better. Um, they're probably not in a place where they can hear it. So um, listening to them is effective, and that makes them feel like you care. So you want to listen, but not to give advice or to fix it or anything like that. And try not to catch their emotional intensity. Um, I say don't catch it, and that's ideal. There are times when you will, you un unwittingly will open yourself up and catch their emotional intensity. So if you find that you do that, you will want to go and try to in institute some emotional insulation in interactions with them so you don't catch their emotional intensity, and you walk away with all of the negative feelings. So because if you catch their uh, emotional intensity, it's what we call projective identification. And that means you walk away with all of the negative feelings and intensity, and they're fine. So you don't want to do that. Some usual ineffective responses. Um, joining, where you try to keep them happy regardless of the cost to you. Um, but it can cause you guilt and feel to feel guilt and shame because it doesn't work or you weren't able to fix it. It's soothing, placating. I just say it to soothe as an effective response, and there are times when that will work. But try not to have it as your usual response. Fight. Um, that's a response where you just don't engage with them. You can be uh, indifferent. You can be defiant. You can challenge them. You can be aggressive or passive aggressive. That doesn't work very well either. And then 
uh, the flight defenses that I mentioned earlier, silence, sulking, avoiding conflicts, not working on disagreements, withdrawal. Um, you'll find that those are not effective either. So here we are back to emotional insulation. It prevents you from catching their feelings or their intensity. And we call that emotional contagion. And yes, you can. Do you know how hard it is to sit with someone who is depressed? You, you just want to get away. Or you get someone who is very, very angry. Um, it's kind of hard to sit with that anger. And you might be open to catching it. It's not so much that it's your feelings. is that their intensity projects itself onto and sometimes into you. And you take it in. And then that's what you feel. Use your emotional insulation before interactions with them. Or when you feel that you're becoming anxious, angry, or any other intense feelings in an in interaction with them. You can use it later, but it's best to have it in place before you get into the interaction. It puts an invisible barrier between you and them so that words get through, not the emotions. Again, you can visualize something between you and them that allows you to hear the words, but the feelings don't get to. Here it is again. And because this is such a wonderful technique, I go into a little bit more detail. And you can still hear the words, <laughs> see the feelings. And, and it doesn't make any difference what it is. It's yours to visualize and yours to put between you and that person. So think of something that fits you, that seems to you would be acceptable to keep out their feelings. Let their words get through so that you can respond appropriately and understand what's causing this. What are some neutral responses? Hey, that's something that you can also use. It can be very effective. And um, you can just chatter. Talk about neutral events. Talk about something that interests them. Just chatter. Chatter, chatter, chatter. But also think of, reflect on prior interactions with them. And then make a list of topics to avoid. There's some, sometimes there's just things you don't want to get into because you know what their responses are going to be. But you may want to make a list to remind yourself to stay away from these topics because they seem to produce a lot of emotional intensity. You can use some distractors. Um, and so the distractors will fall into visual, auditory, tactile, smell, taste. Let's go back. So when they get intense or when they're getting, let's say they're berating you unfairly about something, you can do that as you would sometimes with a child and just distract them with something. So sometimes there's something in the environment that you could distract them with, some sights, some pictures, or this, the sounds in the environment. Oh, hear the birds? Or something like that. Why is that do dog um, barking so much? Tactile is another sensory distractor. And, and I put in here something, fabrics, something like silk. 
So sometimes people like to just pat their clothes. And you could have something like that that you could give them to soothe. It, but it distracts them from whatever it was that was so emotionally intense. There could be some uh, pleasant odors. Um, and you could even bring this in in a way, let's say, that isn't too obvious to say, I really love the smell of chocolate chip cookies baking. And that will produce their vision of chocolate chip cookies. And then taste would be a favorite taste of theirs. Do you know what it is? That's something maybe you could discuss and ask. What, what do you see? What is the favorite taste that you have? Uh, strawberry, vanilla, uh, chocolate. People have lots of favorite tastes. And so that could be a wonderful discussion where you are interested in something that is pleasant for them. So the next slide is about thriving. I know it's hard for you. And that's why you're to be commended is because not everybody can do this caretaking that's needed. So, but you can thrive, even though sometimes you feel like it's just too much for you or too much is being asked of you. What are your goals? Not just with that person. What are your goals in life? What is it that you want to accomplish? So what? just because you're caretaking doesn't mean that you can't work on your goals too. So caretaking is going to take up a big part of your life, but it isn't all of your life. So if you don't have goals in, for other parts of your life, this would be a good chance to develop some and then to work on them. Visualize success in attaining your goals. What would that be like? Uh, if you haven't specified what success would be, this is a good time to try that. Because sometimes we're successful and we haven't allowed ourselves to feel that we're successful. So I'm suggesting take this time to feel successful or to know what it is. Practice positive self-care. Don't do things to yourself that are detrimental to your well-being, whether that's lack of exercise or bad nutrition um, do things for yourself that take care of yourself because remember this other person is dependent on you and maybe others are too um, so when you practice self-care you want to take care of yourself reach out to others don't be afraid to ask for help and if there are times when you just need to get away figure out how you can do that because others will help if you ask them and yeah they'll say general things like let me know what I can what you can do well let them know what you could do that would be real helpful for me is for you to come and sit here for this two hours while I go to the grocery store work to recognize and achieve positives Understand what is positive for you and then go after it. Um, don't wait for it to come to you because all too often it doesn't. And then work on managing adversity. Nothing is easy. And there's nothing in our lives today that doesn't present challenges in one form or the other. So it isn't so much that you have them, it's how do you manage it? And so, yeah, this is something, again, because you're already in this position. Um, you probably know a lot more than I do about how to manage ad adversity. But you'd want I just want to remind you to do that. That will help you thrive. And then achieve balance. 
there's a balance between um, everything. So you want to balance the different parts of your life, the different parts of yourself. You know what that is. Go there. Work on it. It'll help you thrive. So you won't be just doing the minimum. You'll be thriving in spite of everything else. Other positive um, self-care strategies, altruism. They've done numerous studies that people, showing where people who are altruistic uh, feel better about themselves and are able to be more effective. And so what is altruism? It's freely giving of yourself to others with no strings. Um, how often do you receive that? Usually, you, somebody's expecting, if they give you something, they expect and pay back in one form or the other. So if you can practice altruism, just give them giving without expectations of reciprocity, that will make you feel better. Then happiness, ooh, what's happiness? To you means different things to different people. You know when you're happy. So work to be happy. Hobbies, other things, their self-care strategies. If you don't have one, pick up a hobby. Um, I have lots of them. I love crafts. I do scrapbooking. I've done needlepoint. I um, it it really does something for me to engage in some sort of physical hobby, and I get a lot of joy out of that. I'm making something. It's turning out. I'm creating something. I'm thinking of something. And there are times when they're very useful. So it's not just doing something to be doing something. It's something to take care of yourself. Other positive self-care strategies are relationships. You have other relationships other than with this person you're caretaking. Give some time and attention to those. Make those meaningful and enduring. And develop some new relationships. I also like to put creativity in there. Creativity is something new and novel and can be done anywhere, anytime. You don't have to be talented. Uh, I can't sing. I used to be able to dance, <laughs> but because of um, aging, and knee problems, that's lost to me. Uh, I had knee replacement surgery. This has been five years ago now. And the physical therapist who came to work with me after that asked me, what did I want to be able to do? And I said, dance. And you should have seen the look on her face. It was like, huh? But my husband and daughter were there too, and both of them laughed because they knew that I liked to dance. Not talented, but just dance. Inspiration. That can come from anywhere. You can be inspiring. And actually, you probably are inspiring to some because of what you're doing and very, with very difficult people. And then I said meaningful actions. Do something for somebody else. So in other words, you're not just doing something for this one person. You are doing something that means something to you and to somebody else. Okay. For self-absorption, we usually refer to that as narcissism. Well, Kohut 
was a psychologist many, many, many years ago, came up with the concept of healthy adult narcissism. And then we define it. What is healthy adult narcissism? You have meaning and purpose in your life. So as I go through these, you might want to take notes of what you already have. Strong, satisfying, and enduring personal relationships. They're wonderful. And I'm sure you have some. You may not be able to give them the attention that you want to at this point. But you have some, so don't forget that. Happiness and serenity in most parts of your life. So again, we're moving away from just taking care of this self-absorbed parent or this parent who didn't love you like you love them. You get other parts of your life. Try to touch hope, beauty, wonder, and zest every day. Hope, beauty, wonder, zest. These are all parts of healthy adult narcissism. Most important is a capacity to be empathic. And because I teach counseling and because I teach group therapy, we spend a lot of time on empathy. So it's not so much that you respond empathically, but that you are. And, and that's how you got these strong, satisfying, and enduring personal relationships. You were able to be empathic. An appropriate sense of humor. You don't laugh at other people's discomfort their frailties, their um, errors. Uh, I don't know about you and what you find funny. I find a lot of things funny. Absurdities, love puns. I like good jokes, but I don't like jokes that make fun of other people. And that's what we call an appropriate sense of humor. And then a fighting spirit, hardiness, resilience, a fighting spirit. I'm going to get through this. Yeah. Bring on whatever you want to. I'm not giving up. It's sort of like Jim Valvano said, don't give up. Don't ever give up. I know you feel like it sometimes, but don't give up. Keep that fighting spirit. It'll get you through a lot of adversity. Okay, some more things that you can do. Manage your emotions so that they are constructive. Um, some, some emotions are not constructive. Uh, happiness, joy, uh, appreciation, these are all constructive uh, emotions. So try to Keep yourself with the constructive emotions, not the fear, anger, sadness. You can't help but have those at times, but you don't have to stay there. Develop a deeper and more positive understanding of yourself. The more you understand yourself, the more you're going to understand the self-absorbed parent. Uh, I don't know why that works that way, but you do. So if you're working on trying to understand them, the most fruitful way to do that is to understand yourself. Uh, also build your self-confidence, self-efficacy, and have realistic self-esteem. These are always, these are um, all how you can be successful. And so my final suggestions to you are, and I knew this was going to happen. No, doesn't make any difference how many times I go over this. Always they got a word to spell wrong. Give up the fantasy that they're going to see themselves as you do and change their behavior and behavior and attitudes. They're not. Mm -mm. It's a fantasy. You're thinking that the more you give to them, the more they're going to see you as you are. And the more, then the more they're going to be um, appreciative and accepting of you. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. Probably isn't going to happen. So that's a fantasy. 
It's nice fantasy. It would be nice if I could encourage you that it is going to happen. No, you're going to have to do it for yourself. Try to resist manipulation and exploitation of your helpfulness. They take advantage of you. Sure they do. Other people may be doing that too. But you don't have to give in to it. Recognize when it's happening and stop it. Avoid confrontation and conflict, particularly with this parent. Um, it doesn't work. They're not going to see it. And all it does is continue to upset you. So I would say avoid confrontation and conflict. If you think that you're going, if you can tell them something that they're going to be able to see what they're doing and change, that's a part of that fantasy. And then resolve to thrive. That's what that word should be, thrive. You know, you don't have to give up. You don't have to give in. They are as they are. You're doing all that you can for them. Appreciate yourself. Compliment yourself. And resolve to thrive in spite of what they're throwing at you. Okay, Lauren, take it away. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, thank you so much for all of that wonderful information. It was so valuable. Um, now, uh, I'll encourage everybody to submit their questions into the chat box. Um, but as I listened to you speak, and I was thinking about my own personal experience, it made me realize that there's a lot of connections. And I'm sure a lot of people that are attending this can attest to working with someone with dementia, and working with someone who is either narcissistic or has very challenging behaviors, the same similarity of not taking it personally that you, I grew up with it being called gray rocking, right? Where you just, you just sit there and you let it, let it hit you, but you don't take it in. Um, and, you know, it's a very fine, fine line and a fine balance between not invalidating their feelings and their experience, but also not taking on the burden of their emotions and what they're feeling and going through. So thank you again for all that valuable information. Um, mm -hmm. And again, if anybody has any questions or anything that they like to add, please go ahead and submit it into the chat box. It was very well done. So I don't think we're going to have a lot. Um, Especially if there's something that needs more explanation. Mm -hmm. um, someone did ask if this is going to be available. Um, this will be available uh, early next week on YouTube. So I can send out that information to anybody that's interested as well. Um, seem, oh, perfect. Okay. Um, suggestions on how to handle a mother who has dementia and has become very nasty towards uh, this person specifically, but yet continues to be kind to others. Well, there, there are several things. I was just reading something yesterday, and they suggested that you use DICE, D-I-C-E. And DICE is described, so describe what it is that they do. Investigate as to the antecedents of it. Um, create a response. And then evaluate the effectiveness of that response. So with dementia, you've got a lot to take care of because you don't want to dismiss the person. Um, but you also want to take care of yourself. And so it's kind of hard to do this so that you don't feel like you're being selfish. But just know that there's somebody, there's one person at least in the world who doesn't think that you're being selfish when you take care of yourself. Think of it this way. Who would they have to take care of them if you couldn't? Or if you didn't? Because uh, you're doing what others are not doing. And it's something that is needed. 
And so you're to be commended. And don't forget that you're to be commended. Give yourself a hug, several hugs. Um, say I'm retiring soon and planning to move to another state. My mother and I didn't get all of that. Can you finish it? Lauren? Yes, I can. Um, real quick, someone wanted to know what the D in dice stood for. The C is create. No, the D as in dog. Describe. Describe. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, describe what they're doing and oh. saying. Okay. And and try to make it objective. So you want to, you don't want to just say they're so infuriating. You want to describe what it is that they're doing and saying that's infuriating. And sometimes just being able to describe it gives you an idea of what can be done that could be helpful. Perfect. Okay, the next question was, I'm retiring soon and I'm planning to move to another state. My mother suspects that I am moving and is just trying to guilt me about it. I haven't told my mother yet. How do I approach this with her? She currently lives in memory care. That's a hard one because you're not real clear on your motives for moving to another state. And so uh, I suggest that if there's someone you can talk that out with, that would be helpful to you. Why am I moving? Why do I feel like I need to move? Um, yeah, you want to take care of yourself. And yeah, this is your time. But you don't want your mother to feel like you're deserting her. And so my children and grandchildren all there, and let me tell you, grandchildren are wonderful. All the good sense skips a generation and goes straight to the grandchildren. Uh, they are absolutely wonderful. And so you wonder sometimes, how did those kids produce such wonderful kids? But just enjoy them. And um, it's nice to be around them. My daughters are within, both of my daughters are within 10 minutes of me. And two of my grandchildren are around also. So I understand why you would want to be near them because they're so enriching. They give you so much. And the other thing is they make you feel good about yourself. So that's a really good reason for moving. And my grandchildren and children have said that they never leave in Virginia Beach. <laughs> mainly because that's where we are. But there are other reasons, but, you know. So how do you tell your mother? Well, it, you know, you're retiring. You're powering down. And, and so that could be one thing is you tell, I'm powering down. I need to... Um, I want to make sure that I have the richest relationship I can with my children and grandchildren and being near them would help with that. Would mean that we could have family get togethers more often. And I would get to see the milestones as they grow up. And those mean something to you as well as to them. So you need a confidant, somebody who can understand what you're experiencing and maybe even your motives and help you sort those out so that you can explain them in a way that could be acceptable to your mother. So um, that's going to be the best that I can do. I don't have any magic words, except I'm out of here. <laughs> Thank you for that. We had another person ask, can you go over how to detach from the aging parent who is angry, hates everyone, and has intense feelings without taking on 
taking that on. How did you detach from somebody like that? Um, that's where you use your emotional insulation so that you can hear them, but you don't catch those feelings. And so detaching from them is to build yourself so that you understand where they end and you begin and how you are a completely different person from them. And don't try to talk them out of being angry and hateful and dismissive. Uh, yeah, it would be nice if they could see that and would stop. But you're not, it's not going to work and they're not going to change. So don't waste your time and effort. Adopt a kind of, yeah, I think I understand. I see what you're saying. It's kind of placating, but in a nice way. Not in a way that is uh, telling the person they're wrong, but in a way that, yeah, I'm just trying to understand. Okay, perfect. Um, next question. How do you deal with an individual who cries on a daily to try to get what they want multiple times a day? That's also projecting the feeling to um, induce guilt and shame because we are acculturated to feel like we need to do something about this or we did something to cause that distress. And so, again, your emotional insulation could come into play because unless there is um, something that you can do that, that there is physically something you can do that um, would help soothe or fix the tears, your best bet is going to be your emotional insulation and understand that, and you are understanding that they're doing it to try to get their way. And of course, in some instances, you might as well just go ahead and let them have their way. And in other instances, you may want to reflect on, okay, what is the real message that they're trying to convey? And it could be, that's why the description of what they're doing is helpful. It could be that they're feeling hopeless and helpless and they've lost independence and there have been other losses and they're grieving. And so um, the tears might be for the losses. And that would help you understand why it is. And to get their own way, they can't do it for themselves. So they want to manipulate others into doing it for them. And this is really, really hard because your heart goes out to them. And you do want to soothe those tears. You could ask, what can I do to make it better? Or what would you like me to do to make it better? And then see what the answer is. If it's something you can do, then that's fine. If it's not, then you need to let it go. A lot of our distress comes from us feeling like we have to fix it. We have to take care of it. And that there's something wrong with us if we don't. And sometimes we don't even really know what it is that they want. So try to get them to describe and, and, and what's preventing them from getting what they want for themselves. So the more you can empower them to understand themselves and take care of themselves, um, the less they're going to re request this of you. And so <laughs> aging, you're losing a lot. And sometimes it makes you angry. Sometimes it makes you sad. And you feel so helpless to do anything about it. And you are. 
for the most part. And you're having to rely on the kindness of other people. And sometimes that's hard because uh, all of our lives we've been told to be independent, to take care of yourself, to take care of others. So it's kind of hard to give it up and say, okay, I can't do it. I need you to do it. I don't know that that's helpful at all. It's uh, it's important. I think what you what you keep reiterating how important it is to one try to understand where they're coming from and you know what's causing what's the root cause, but also at the same time you can't control their emotions. You can only do what you can do, um, and with that knowledge, just understanding that you're not you're the target, but you can, you can own your own emotions. Yep. I think that might have been, theirs. yeah, <laughs> let them have theirs and you can keep yours. Um, I, I don't see any other questions unless anybody has a last minute. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you again, Dr. Brown, so much for your time and your, your knowledge and sharing that with us. Um, if anybody has um, any further questions or would, would more information regarding resources, please feel free to call the ALS OC helpline um, at 844-373-4400. That information is also in the PowerPoint slides. Um, again, please remember to complete the survey. It's just such a valuable tool for us to help us to continue to build um, our webinars and provide education to the community. Um, and again, uh, thank you everybody for joining and have a wonderful rest of your day. And thanks again, Dr. Brown. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.